So, I'd like to welcome everyone to the, uh, our two presenters. We have Mr. David Crane. I still have fond memories of a boy in his blog. And Mr. Uh, Gary Kitchen. Three words. Donkey Kong Coleco. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll turn it over to them. Hey, guys. Hour presentation. We were counting on a 45-minute introduction. <laughs> Darn. So, Followed by Q and A. Let us down. So yeah, I mean we uh, we we try to come to these retro gaming shows because everybody always has a lot of questions for us. So we're going to open it up for questions pretty quickly, um, largely because it leads us into other stories. But um, what we've found over the years is people just want to hear stories about how the, those games were made in the good old days. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to come up with a couple, and then that will remind us of a couple others, and we'll just kind of freeform for a while. Um, but first, I got a question that's come up in my work recently. Audience participation, who invented the video game? Anybody? I got a hand in the back. Ralph Bear. Just yell it out, Ralph R Bear. Who else? Because that's not correct, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, nobody wants to say Nolan Bushnell, um, Steve Russell. Does that name mean anything to anybody? Right. The uh, first video game of any kind was done on an oscilloscope in a lab in like 1958. A guy by the name of Willie Higginbotham. Household name, right? Um, nobody knows his name. I just happened to have looked it up recently, and I think that's what it is. I'm vaguely trying to remember. Um, and it's interesting because uh, anybody know what an oscilloscope is? We got some engineers in the group. An oscilloscope is actually one of the most important inventions in last century because it allowed an electronic engineer to visualize a waveform, an invisible thing you know, a, a voltage changing, an electromagnetic signal. And uh, oscilloscope is typically designed to um, display a voltage signal against a time constant, so you can just see waveforms. You've seen them in every 1950s movie and, you know, since, of these sine wave waveforms on some little round screen. That's an oscilloscope. And leave it to somebody to say, hey, wait a minute, I can make a video game on, on this, you know. Um, I was quoted once, um, given credit for Crane's Law, which is that man always uses his highest technology to amuse himself. <laughs> and um, this occurred to me when I was like 12 years old, and one of the biggest research projects going on in the military was trying to figure out how to make an electric airplane. Um, an electric motor and power source that was powerful enough to lift its own weight. And the day I, you know, when I was 12 years old is when a Japanese toy company announced that they had just come out with one. Um, now it's a little different, of course, economies of size and whatever, but a toy company came up with the electric airplane before our military could. Um, same, same thing, you know, you see all these technologies and uh, the video game is really just the latest and greatest example of that. The technology in some of the today's machines are better than certainly what are in our uh, military simulators in some cases now. For a while they were a little ahead, but now the number of polygons we can push in these machines. So, so anyway, but uh, invent invention of video games. So Willie Higginbotham put it on an oscilloscope, and nobody knows his name because he really didn't sell any. Um, Steve Russell was really kind of next in the big stories. He was a, a college student at MIT, I think, and on a mainframe computer uh, with a vector could have been vector, could have been raster, it's probably a vector display. Uh, made space, that one's called Space War. Yeah, Space War. And it was, it looked kind of like asteroids, ships flying around where you would thrust and, and rotate and thrust, and it had you know, zero gravity physics going on. And then Ralph Baer mentioned, um, Ralph Baer created the brown box for Magnavox, which became the Magnavox Odyssey 1 about three or four years later. And um, Ralph is another example of, uh, he had an idea and he had a situation where he was given enough free reign to go and try to do that idea and he created, he basically created the first ping pong game uh, and convinced Magnavox to sell it. 
And then came Nolan Bushnell. Now what Nolan did, turns out Nolan saw Ralph Baer's work um, and said, this is a great idea for a game. Let's make one you put a quarter into. So he created, uh, well first of all, he saw Steve Russell's work, computer, or space war, space war, and made computer space as an arcade game. Then he saw Ralph Baer's work and he said, let's make Pong on the, in the arcade. And um, so he is credited often as the father of video games because he, he was the father of arcade games and then he took them home and was very successful. So it's like Ralph Baer is always called the father of video games and Nolan Bushnell is often called the father of the video game industry, the business or whatever, because he was great at marketing. But in fact, there were two guys before either of those two guys. So that's the end of my rant. But, um. <laughs> so that brings us to the Atari 2600, <laughs> which Nolan eventually launched because he wanted to make a machine that could play combat and Pong and also accept cartridges. And that's where Dave came into the picture, working at Atari. Yeah, um, again, Nolan had the good fortune of, he made Pong in the arcade and made some money off of it and said, this should go in the home. And one of the things that Atari was doing in those early days is they were taking their arcade game successes and making home versions of them. So if you played, had a favorite game in the arcade and you wanted to have a home version, you really didn't have any choice but to go with the Atari system. Um, first of all, Atari had some systems that were dedicated. You could get a Pong console and that's all it did. And in 1977, they uh, introduced the video computer system. And I was, or 75, they introduced it. No, 77. Yeah, 77 early, they, they launched it. They'd been working on it for a couple of years. And I joined in late 77. And so uh, all the engineers were still there. Joe DeCure, the chip designer, one of the two chip designers was there. And um, so I was able to interface with those guys and know what they were doing. And, in essence, as Gary said, they had a couple successes in the arcades. One was Pong, which is still successful as an arcade game. And another one of their big ones was called Tank. And if you've played combat, you've played the exact same layout of Tank. Blocky play field with the two tanks moving around. So the 2600 hardware was made to play Tank and Pong. If you look at the hardware and break it down, there's two tanks each with a missile and a blocky play field that you can create. And then there's another object over here that was called the ball. And the ball had smoother motion. It could actually move more smoothly than the two missiles. And so literally, they, they made a video game, one of the first that was not dedicated. It was not just one game. They made this thing, and they made it cartridge programmable so that you could buy both the tank cartridge and the pong cartridge, which was called Combat and Video Olympics were the two, two games. So that was really the intention, was to make it have Tank and Pong. And um, before long, there were, anybody have any idea how many thousands of games were done for the 2600? I don't even know what the number is. It's a big number. It's a big number, and if you take all of them and put them together, <laughs> all of them, and put all of them together, it's probably smaller than the icon on your iPhone for a game that you download free today. Yeah, if you download Stella, you can then also download the zips of every cartridge that they've ever uploaded. And it's like three or four 300k byte zips, something like that. So just to get a sense, who in the audience has seen us talk before? Because we have a lot of stories and uh, most of you have not. That's good. Good. That's good. So we can repeat a lot of our old stories because we don't want to repeat all the old stories if everybody's heard them already. So let's talk about Pitfall because you guys have heard of Pitfall. And 90% of the stories are in the zooming back to Pitfall. So Pitfall. Dave, how did you come up with the idea for Pitfall? All right. This is 1982. Um, founded Activision in 79. Had done a few games for Activision. Um, when I was at Atari, as Gary was pointing out, and as I said, our goal was to make our home versions of the arcade games. So when I started, there was an arcade game called um, Gunfighter or Gunslinger or something like that. 
and I saw it and I liked it and I made Outlaw. Now it wasn't actually an Atari arcade game, but the thrust was bring the arcade home, so I did that. Uh, they also had Canyon Bomber was an arcade that was out, and Depth Charge. They had two successful uh, games out there. $4,000 arcade games, two of them, and I put both of them into a 2K byte Atari 2600 cartridge, which I was proud of at the time. But we weren't doing much in the way of original games. When we founded Activision, we no longer had a bunch of coin ops that we owned, a bunch of arcade games that we could then take into the home. So we had to actually think of original concepts, uh, with the exception of the first one I did, which is Dragster, which is a copy of a coin op game called Drag Race. But outside of that one. Outside of that one. Right. So um, at the time, video games were copies of arcades. There really wasn't much going on that was too original. And pretty much because of the way the hardware was designed to make tanks, um, generally the objects in the game that you controlled were non-human. They were spaceships and jet planes and tanks and, and those sorts of things. And I wanted to make a game where there was a realistic human figure in a game. Um, so I set out to create a realistic human figure. And I did that by walking around the design lab and freezing in position, sketching where my feet were, doing like an animator's tasks like that, and then trying to reduce it to a few pixels, which was, of course, the hardest thing to do. Um, since we're going to have kind of free form, leave it right there and I'll tell a story from Atari. Um, I did a slot machine at Atari. And slot machines are typically reels full of cherries, lemons, um, bars. Bars are easy. They're square. Um, you know, various things like that. And uh, so Atari had an art department who were drawing the manuals and that sort of thing. So I called a couple of the gals from the art department. We had a meeting and brought them down. And I said, here's the slot machine I'm doing. And um, here's what I want. I want realistic looking cherries. Um, lemons, all this kind of thing. And then I gave them a piece of graph paper and I colored in a box and I said, and here's how many pixels you have to work with. These are the dots you have to use. Now, it's impossible. I mean, it's an impossible task to make a cherries out of eight bits. And a bunch of three cherries out of eight bits, well, that's two bits each. It's a square. <laughs> and, you know, it's virtually impossible. But my boss said, well, bring down the artists, see what they can figure out, you know. So, I mean, they looked at me like I was insane because I was asking them to do an impossible task. But that kind of illustrates what we did back then, is we had to make these things look like something realistic. And one of the tricks to do that is to make it something that you can do in pixels. Um, so I, my slot machine ended up with cars. And um, I took an 8-bit left half of a car, and I could put two of them side by side and flipped it. So there was a left and right hand. So symmetry across around a vertical boundary. Um, and it didn't look too bad, the car. I did cactus. You know, that's pixel, 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 pixel. And, and that all worked. But um, anyway, so we're talking about an era where you're doing your art by coloring in block boxes in a graph paper, and you're very limited in what that could look like. So it's, that's the environment in which I said, I'm going to make a realistic human figure. And it was a tall order. But eventually, I didn't do too bad a job. I was able to do colorization on single lines of pixel resolution and you know, other technical advancements that made it possible to look a little bit more human. And uh, pretty much had Pitfall Harry done. Didn't know he was named Pitfall Harry yet, though. Um, so now you got this human figure. What do you do with it? I uh, set out to design a cops and robbers game. It was kind of cool. I took this, the guy and I gave him horizontal and vertical white stripes, so he was a robber. You know, he was in a striped uniform. That worked really easily. Um, tried to do something along those lines. Worked for several months on a game and didn't like the way it came out, so I put this little running man on the shelf, and then I did, I don't know, Freeway or Grand Prix or something. You know, I, I would do these games. I would try this thing and then put it on the shelf and do a game and get it done and publish it, and then I'd say, you know, I go back. And finally, in 1982, um, I just said, all right, I'm going to use this, and I'm not going to give up on him. So I took a little piece of blank sheet of paper and drew my little running man on the middle of the paper. And I uh, said, all right, 
what is he running on? Two lines across that to make a path. So he's running on a path. Well, where is a path? Let's put the path in a jungle. I drew some trees. Why is he running? Uh, let's have him collecting treasures. Let's have him being chased by rolling logs. Let's you know do this sort of thing. And, and pretty much sketched up the concept for Pitfall in about 10 minutes. Um, then, because I had to write every line of program, make every sound effect, every pixel of art, etc., I sat at a computer for about a thousand hours to make it happen. But it was really a ten-minute idea on paper. Yep. Originally called Jungle Runner, every game had an in-house name that you would uh, refer to it as until the marketing department figured out what the name of the game was. That was Jungle Runner. Um, freeway was Splat. Squish. Squish. And it used to be a guy, not a chicken. <laughs> and it was changed into a guy, in the, uh, into a chicken in the 11th hour. Uh, Keystone Capers was Cops, of course. Um, and you know, it's funny. Anybody who's ever named anything, you know, start a company, try to figure out a name for it, it is really hard. And the worst thing you can do is have a working title because you've used that for months and months and months. And now everybody says, okay, what are we going to call the game? And everybody looks at you and said, it's Jungle Runner. I mean, it is, because it has been for all this time. And it's really hard to let go of that. And we had these knockdown, drag out brainstorming sessions trying to figure out what to call that stupid game. And, um, oh, let's see. Zulu Gold was one of the names because you collect gold. And, you know, this is the 1980s, and everybody thought that was some brand of weed. And there's some other drug reference, you know, so we couldn't use that one. Um, Amazon this, and, you know, we tried all these things. And I happen to like puns, and Pitfall was my suggestion, and uh, for some reason it stuck. Marketing department did have to get involved to put the exclamation point after it, but that's... <laughs> they, that's why they get paid the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? So I joined Activision, Dave started it in the late 70s, I joined in 1982. I was on the East Coast, I had reverse engineered the Atari, I was working in the um, toy industry, doing electronic toys, and um, it was pretty clear to me that the TV games were going to kill the electronic toys. So I reverse engineered the Atari to be able to do games on that, kind of a defensive mechanism to make sure I had a job. and. Um, did the home version of Donkey Kong. I have, to collect, I have to correct the guy that introduced us. I did not do Donkey Kong on ColecoVision. I did Donkey Kong on 2600. Uh, so I did that version, which was 4K. Um, and then I picked up the phone one day and called Activision's main number and said, can I talk to the guy in charge of product development? And I actually got through to a vice president and I said, I make 2,600 games. And he said, no, you don't. And I said, no, really, I do, because <laughs> Donkey Kong hadn't come out at that point. And I explained to him what I was doing, and he said, I'll be right out. And he flew to New Jersey and met me in my basement and hired me. And I started Activision's East Coast office. That was the first satellite office of Activision. Activision went off to launch a number of satellite offices, satellite design offices, because we found that small groups of four to 10 people working autonomously was a great way to make games. Mine was the first. We opened one in Pasadena, one in Boston, a few other places. A lot of them never delivered a game. But our group did deliver games. First game I did was Keystone Capers. Um, and then I got to know Dave. That was June of 1982. And Dave and I have worked together ever since. So it was good, uh, good start. Um, good stories. I'll tell you a good story. I joined in June of 82. Uh, brought five people with me, uh, opened an office in New Jersey. First thing we did, first week on the job, I flew to Chicago to meet Activision at the Consumer Electronics Show, which was a twice a year event, June and January. June was in Chicago, January was in Vegas. So I'm all pumped up, joining the greatest video game company in the world. Limo picks me up at the airport. They treated their game designers very well. So I had a limo waiting for me. I get in the limo, and lo and behold, there's Larry Kaplan, founder of Activision, sitting in the limo as well. And I'm kaboom, kaboom. Yeah. I'm awestruck. 
you know, shaking in my boots, get in the back seat with Larry, and the limo pulls away, and I go, hey, Larry, how's it going? How's, how are, you know, how are things at Activision? And he goes, they're okay. He goes, they were better before we started hiring all the new people. <laughs> so that was it. That was my introduction to Activision. <laughs> I, that was also Larry. I leaned <laughs> down in the seat as low as I could go to make myself invisible and went to the gym, CES. But, you know, there, there's actually a um, backstory to that. You know, at Activision, we founded with, four programmers and a business guy and venture capital funding. And venture capital, they had never funded software before. They always wanted to build a box, build a gadget, build a something, so it's kind of hard. And it is kind of difficult to understand when all your assets walk out the door. If you're basically hiring the brains of this group and they walk out the door every night, so what are you funding? But um, Jim Levy, the guy we chose as president, um, was great at that. He worked all that out and he was also a marketing genius, so that was nice. But here we are with four guys um, designing games, and we're able to put out half a dozen games a year. And he comes in, he says, you know, we got to grow this company. How do we grow? And I said, well, we're not working any more hours. And he said, yeah. Um, so we had to figure out a way to hire people. But what we loved about what we were doing is we had four people who worked really well together. We, would, we worked in an open lab, and everybody had a TV and a computer and a monitor and all this. and um, if you rolled into your cubicle in this open lab and you were concentrating, nobody bothered you. Everybody knew to leave you alone. It's very difficult work sometimes doing a video game because you got to keep a thousand details in your mind. What did I do back there so that it makes sense up here and, and that sort of thing. So nobody would bother you if you were concentrating. But if you rolled your chair back, leaned back in the chair and were play testing what you had just done, you were fair game, so people could chat, people could talk to you. And, and what happened was we would all kibitz on everybody's games at that point when you were testing and playing, and someone else would grab the controller and say, that sucks, or whatever, and, and you would talk about how to make it better. And that synergy was what made the early Activision games fabulous. The fact that we had 100 years of experience of making games sitting there, you know, all together helping um, in certain circumstances. So how do you grow that? Well, obviously, you don't want to have 30 people there. You can't do the same thing. So the first thing we did, we hired Steve Cartwright. Uh, he was a friend of mine, and um, you know, I'd talked to him enough that I knew what he was capable of, and I vouched for him, and I knew he would fit in with a group, so we, you know, we felt good about it. But then we said, I don't know. We can't make this any bigger, or we lose the thing that makes it special. And along comes these guys with this office 3,000 miles away with another five guys who like to work together, who um, if we put them in the exact same kind of environment, they might be able to make games, and we don't have to bother with them. Right. It was nothing brilliant. I dropped out of the sky. Yeah, they don't, they don't, <laughs> Phone rang, and they said, hey, they're so far away, they'll never bother us. Yeah, they don't screw with our group's synergy. <laughs> and um, so, like, you know, Tom flew out there, the vice president flew out there, Got him an office, got him computers, got him set up, and said, go. Yeah. And um, that turned out to be serendipity, but it was brilliant. And we said, hey, we could have four or five or six guys scattered all over the country with their own little offices and see what they come up with. And it, each one would have their own synergy. And uh, that became what we called the design center concept. It actually became a Harvard Business School case study at one point about how to design, how to make groups that design. And as Gary said, we then opened one in Boston, uh, Pasadena, and I think Sacramento may have been the last one. Right. We had five or six of these things all over the country, with four, five, six people working together. Um, Unfortunately, so the flip side of that is they're so far from the mothership that they better be self-motivated and brilliant, or you may not get anything out of them because they're so far away that they're somewhat unmanaged. And that happened a little bit too. I think there were design centers that never delivered a product. Had a lot of half done games. Half done games are pretty easy to do. It's the finished ones are the hard ones. Yep. So here's a random story. Um, sounds on the Atari 2600 were challenging. Today if you do a sound in a game you just you can digitize it. You record it. Or 
You can use synthesizers, create wild sound, as many tools. 2600, it was none of that. <clears throat> the way it sounds is you write code. And you, you wrote 6502 code, and you created a sound. Uh, and this is actually a Dave story, but I'll tell it. Um, Carol Shaw was working on River Raid. And uh, River Raid, great game. Great game. Um, and she rolled her chair back like Dave described and said, you know, I need a sound for when you're getting low on fuel. And Dave just turned around and started spouting out 6502 code. He said, write this down. Write this down. Load the accumulator, decrement. Da -da 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 and she's furiously typing it in. And then she assembles and hits go. And she hears, whoop, 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 whoop. And she just stopped and looked at Dave and her jaw dropped. Like, how did you do that? It's just incredible. You know what's funny is, is Bob Whitehead, Alan Miller, and Larry Kaplan were also in the room at the same time and saw her, her jaw drop. And I looked at them and they said, what? Any one of us, any one of us could have done it. <laughs> then another sound story is um, my game, Pressure Cooker. Uh, I was so tired of all the games having terrible music. Music was just awful on, 20, on 2600 games. And it was mainly awful because there were only certain tones in the 2600 chip. And it wasn't designed to be in tune. Those tones were not the correct tones to be in tune notes. They were a division ratio down from the system clock. I mean, right. It was, it, it was whatever was convenient to the chip guy. Yeah. So you would have people do, do songs in some of the early Atari games. And it just was awful. It was sour. And I couldn't stand it. And I'm not a musician, but I knew bad when I, when I heard it. So I said, you know, I want a jingle in this game. But I don't want it to suck. I mean, I want a jingle. So what I did was I went through the entire scale of notes that were tones that were generated in 2600, and I compared them to a Casio keyboard, and I found which ones were in tune. And there weren't that many, maybe half. Some were in tune. So I took the Casio keyboard, and I marked with tape which ones were in tune <coughs> on the scale of the keyboard, on the keys. And I hired a professional jingle writer from New York City, and I brought him in. His name was Steve Gabori. He did a lot of big jingles and, you know, all over the place. He's still around. You can look him up online. And I sat him down, and I said, I want you to write a song for my video game. He said, great. I said, you can only use those keys that are marked. <laughs> and he said, you're kidding me, right? I said, no, I want you to write a song, and I want you to write it only with these keys. And he thought of that a little bit, and in about a half hour, he did it. And he said, that was really fun. And I used it, and lo and behold, it sounds fine. It sounds like a song. So, I mean, this is, this is the stuff we actually had to do. It's just like when you go to the artist and say, these are your pixels. You go to the sound effects and right. the sound guys and say, so, these are the keys. Yeah. And he thought I was nuts, but it worked. I mean... Again, we were doing art by drawing picture or coloring in boxes on graph paper. And then you would go down and write in their binary and hexadecimal value, and then roll over to your keyboard and type them in one at a time. So my graphics are now C4, A9, you know. Right, no Photoshop. Going back earlier in Photoshop, who's ever heard of Deluxe Paint? Deluxe Paint was an electronic arts product in the, that we used for the Commodore. But back in the Atari era, no drawing packages, none of that. Everything was on graph paper, turned into hexadecimal, typed in by hand. All the graphics in the games. Yeah, the, the first professional video game artists were using deluxe paint and a koala pad, which was a touch-sensitive uh, pad with a stylus. Right, and by that point, I guess it was Commodore we were on. That was on C64. Yeah, yeah that was on C64. So, uh, actually, one of the coolest things Dave ever wrote on 2600, which no one has ever seen and probably never will see, was he wrote an animation tool. He wrote a tool that, with a joystick, you could draw a character in eight pixels and then step and go to the next frame and change him a little and step and go to the next frame so that we could create animations. And you did that probably sometime after Pitfall, because I remember the character Pitfall was in there as a preloaded animation. Vague recollection, I may have written it on the Commodore 64, but I'm not sure. No, you wrote it on the Atari. It was on the, it was on the Atari before the 64. So we, now we had a tool where we could actually sit, lean back in the easy chair and pixelize characters and, and build frames. 
and it may have dumped to the PDP-11 data. I'm not actually sure if it did or not. But it was on the, definitely on the Atari 2600. I don't now, remember. I, I wrote it. <laughs> I, another great story, when I, when I joined Activision, I was doing my Atari work. I had reverse engineered the Atari. And the reason I was able to do it, fortunate for me, was that the Atari had a 6502 chip in it, and so did the Apple II. And I bought a very early Apple II and immediately figured out that the Atari had the same chip in it. So I created an umbilical cord. I was an electrical engineer. I created an umbilical cord that connected the Apple II to the Atari, and I was able to dump uh, games into the Apple II uh, ROM space and then read them, disassemble them, use tools on the, on the Apple II to read the code, and then I figured out how it worked. So I had my entire development environment on an Apple II. I did my, wrote my code. I assembled it when you turn it from human language into binary, used an assembler on the Apple II. And then I joined Activision. And they very proudly told me, oh, you don't have to use that anymore. We, we use PDP-11s, which are these computers the size of a garage and that have a 6502 assembler on them. And we spent tens of thousands of dollars installing a, a, a PDP-11 in our office in Glen Rock, New Jersey, on the East Coast, um, to do this. And I was thrilled, because I was saying, I got this cruddy little Apple II here. I have this monster of technology here, can you imagine? Because assembling takes a long time. Back then it did. You'd hit assemble and walk away for five minutes and come back and your code's assembled. And after it was all done, the PDP-11 was all set up, I found out that it assembled it about four times slower <laughs> than the Apple II did. I was not pleased. Well, it was, it was set up for time sharing. Everybody had a data terminal, so now you've got the loss. Right, now I'm time sharing with all these people, and now my assembling took five times longer. So DSL versus cable modem. I was very tempted to do Keystone Capers on the Apple because it was much faster than the PDP-11. But um, we had a blue box, um, which was a um, 6502 computer <clears throat> that I had designed and made, and it had an umbilical that plugged right into an Atari 2600. And that's how we did our development. So there was this box, and the 2600 sat on top of it, and the cable came out of it and went down. Um, and the only reason I bring it up is because you have to realize that we had to make everything, every tool we did, we had to make. We had to make all the hardware, we had to make all the software tools, the animation tool, the drawing, you know, whatever we did, we had to make. We started Activision in, incorporated, I think, October 15th, 1979 and by January 6th of the following year we were at the Consumer Electronics Show with six games. Uh, they weren't yet finished but they were finished enough to show, to actually demonstrate at the show. To do that I had to make five or four, at least four blue boxes for the four founding game designers and design two games, Dragster and Fishing Derby. In that two and a half months that we had, and I didn't feel rushed at all. <laughs> we were having so much fun, um, but yeah, you know, we were working long hours. Um, but it was actually years later that I did my first overnighter working with him. Yeah, I, dra I dragged him into the overnighters. That was the boy and his blob. Yeah. Boy and his blob. Interesting story about that game. We had. Um, our company had become the first company in the U.S. that was developing NES software in the U.S. What company? Uh, Absolute Entertainment, which I had founded after leaving Activision. Um, then Dave joined shortly after that, and um, Nintendo came out with the NES in 1985, and it was clear by 1986 that it was starting to sell. So I went to Seattle to meet me with Nintendo, and I said, you know, we're game designers. We've done all these games. We want to support the NES. And they said, you make games? And we said, yeah, yeah. Here's all the games we've done. We make games. Why make games in the NES? And they said, why would you want to do that? They said, all the games are made in Japan. Why would, there's no reason for you to make games. Just go to Japan. There's hundreds of games. Just acquire the games that are there. Bring them over and sell them. I said, well, we, yeah, we actually make games. And it took a long time to explain this to them. And then they said, well, all right, let's just say hypothetically we let, we let you make games on our system. And they had, unlike Atari, where you could back engineer it and just do it and it's no big deal, and yada, yada. On the NES, they had 
patented chips where the chip talked to the cartridge, and you couldn't make games on the NES without going through Nintendo unless you were going to spend millions of dollars on lawsuits and fighting a patent. So eventually they said, all right, let's just say hypothetically we want you to make games on our platform. The only development system we have costs $35,000, and all the technology is in Japanese. So we can sell you one of those. And I said, well, you know what? I said, back, back at the office, I've got David Crane. I said, how about you let us make games on it, and we'll figure out our own development box? And they said, yeah, good luck. So I went back, and Dave built another blue box. <laughs> Only this blue box worked with the NES. And we showed it to Nintendo, and they said, holy cow. So they allowed us to start selling that blue box to other people in the US who wanted to make NES games. So we were really the first. We weren't the first publisher on the NES. Acclaim was the first publisher on the NES, another spin-off of Activision. But we were the first to actually write code on the NES in the US. And we did a couple of games for Activision and other people. Um, and then we said, we should publish a game ourselves. And Dave said, I have an idea. And he flew to New Jersey. He was, I was New Jersey, he was California. Flew to New Jersey in March, maybe, and brought up this little demo of a guy standing next to this little white blob, and he tossed him a jelly bean, and the blob went, Bloop, turned into a ladder. And everybody immediately got it and said, that's really cool. There's only one problem was that Nintendo had a immovable deadline that you had to have games delivered to them final code form by May 30th, or you didn't make Christmas. And it was no negotiations, no ifs, ands, or buts, nothing. May 30th, 5 o'clock, or we don't even look at your code till next year. And this was probably, this actually was April. It was April. And we said, this is really cool. We got to do this. But we don't have that much time. I mean, it's ridiculous. An NES game takes a year. So we called in a bunch of, we've got people that work for us, um, including this one guy that was so smart, I think he was from another planet. Um, unbelievable programmer. And we brought like four or five of them in a room and David demoed the game and we talked about what it was going to be. This character is a toolkit and you throw him jelly beans, he turns into objects and you navigate this giant adventure. And everybody was really pumped up and it has to be done by May 30th. And as we were walking out, Rick, the really brilliant guy, stopped and he asked me a question. He goes, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, Rick. Real quiet guy. He said, is it normal to do a game like this in five weeks? <laughs> And I said, um, let's just see how we do. So he wrote a lot of great base code. And, and Dave and I went off to write the game code. And we decided to make it two worlds, the, the first world of Earth and then Blavolonia, because it was easy for us to split it into two games. So I did Blavolonia, and Dave did the main world. And Rick went off and wrote a lot of the base code. And because we were on a five-week schedule, we flew Dave from his beautiful house in California into a dump in Glen Rock, New Jersey, little $200 a week rental. Uh, I had a name for it. Yes. I called it the flop house. It was the flop house. It was one room with a you know, 1934 tube TV and dust everywhere, but it was two blocks from the office. So he flew out and lived in there for five and a half weeks, and we did the entire game in five and a half weeks. And that's where he got his taste of all-nighters. The end of that project, um, the last two weeks were 16 hours a day, which sounds like, gee, you got eight hours of sleep, right? Well, it doesn't always work that way, but 16 hours a day. The last week, it ran up to 20 hours. Now, this was 20 hours depending on how long I could stay awake. So I would literally walk down two blocks down the street and sleep for four hours and get back up and walk over and work for another 20 hours which was fine until two days before where we cut out the four hours of sleep. So two days of all, all 24 hours a day, all nighters. Now that doesn't mean that I didn't, you know, doze with my eyes open looking at the computer screen occasionally. I probably did, wouldn't even notice. Um, but we did it because this was our first game we were gonna publish under our names and it was a great game and it really was coming out really good. And, and we were going to make this deadline. And there's something to remember. This is 1988, maybe. There was no FedEx. It was, the concept of shipping something overnight next day didn't exist. 
So how are we going to get it to Seattle? We had to get EEPROMs. We had to get e-proms. physical EEPROMs, hand them to Juana Tingdale at Nintendo by 5 o'clock on May 30th. Ah, uh, we had an idea. So we, we went to one of our engineers and we said, what are you doing the next couple of days? So we packed up an entire development system, including EEPROM burners and computers and everything. We flew him to Seattle and we put him up in a hotel across the street from Nintendo. And he sat there for two days until 4 o'clock in the afternoon on May 30th when we modemed him the final code. He burned the EEPROMs, checked out of his hotel, went across the street, 5 o'clock, walked in, handed it to one thing, and we made the deadline. Uh, it was amazing. And we felt great because we had given it to our testing department, and the game was bug-free. And then we had to get on a plane and fly to June 1st CES in Chicago that we talked about before and demo the game. That's what you do. You stand there, you demo the game all day. We'd already been up for 48 hours. We'd been up for 48 hours. So we got on a plane, we went there, and then we landed that night in Chicago. And we still had, we had development systems with us in case we saw a bug at the show. We wanted to fix it and maybe get a rev into Nintendo in time, even though they had said no more code after 5 o'clock on June 30th, on May 30th. So... We're sitting in the hotel room, 10 o'clock at night. We're a little fried. Can't wait to sleep for the next morning show. And one of the guys, one of our guys, is playing the game in our rooms. So we're all sitting in one of the big rooms playing the game. And he goes, oh, crap. I just saw a bug. So Dave and I look at each other and we go, what planet was it on? Oh, it was on Bob Loney. All right, so it's Gary's bug. So I roll over here. And I've got, we have a computer all set up, so I change it, find it, assemble, make new binary, burn a ROM, give it to the guy and go, oh, thank God. Thank God we found that before the show. Wait, just saw another bug. Dave, this one's yours. This went on all night. We must have found 200 bugs between 10 o'clock at night and 7 in the morning. Never slept again. Stayed up all night fixing bugs, cursing. The testing department. What, do these people never play this game? I mean, just horrible bugs. So at 7 in the morning, we burned new ROMs. Said, we got to go to the show. <laughs> Went to the show, stood on the floor of the show the whole day. Now we were three days without sleep. And showed the new ROM that um, was clean. It was pretty clean, and you had a pretty good relationship with Juana and managed to get a... Uh, yeah, I got a rev in, rev in. And then we sat there and said, we made the date. We're going to get these for Christmas. And around November, it was uh, September. September, Howard Phillips from Nintendo calls up. We hadn't heard from Nintendo between May and September. We figured, wow, they're out there building those ROMs. This is great. We're going to get this for Christmas. Oh, yeah, I call in September, and they decide to give us feedback on the game. I'm like, you're giving us feedback now? And they said, we want you to know we really like this game. I'm really surprised you Americans can make games. <laughs> we really like this game. So they gave us some feedback, we made the changes, and we ended up getting the game in maybe November, right before Christmas. Well, it was, um, it turned out it was the most popular game in the halls of Nintendo. Everybody was playing it, and then they moved it up to the middle management and then upper management, and it was being played to the exclusion of all else in Nintendo. And remember, the reason you had to put out a game or get a, get a game to them by June 1st, May 31st, whatever, was First, they have to go through all of their testing and their approval process. Then, this has to be manufactured as a ROM. It's not making a CD, it's not, you know, modeming code, whatever. It is um, a semiconductor process where they actually have to go into the semiconductor manufacturing and change the mask on the ROM and put it inside a chip and in plastic. And, and so there's a, a major manufacturing process that it had to go through. And, you ask anybody how long that takes, and they all tell you it's three months or whatever. So Nintendo had this all figured out of when you had to have the code done. But they liked this game. But they liked it so much, except for one feature, that they said, we're not going to put it out as it is, as great as it is, because the, the president of the company lost his blob and got mad. <laughs> Because there was this circumstance where cause the, you could send the blob away as a bird or drop him over a cliff. or Then there was a, a small, minute chance the blob never came back. <laughs> Not exactly sure where he went, no, but you, you he, he was, couldn't get back. You throw him down there, 
And then normally you would throw him a honey, honey jelly bean, turn him into a hummingbird, he flies back to you, then you whistle and he stops. But if you run away to a point where he can't get to as a hummingbird, or you know, that sort of thing, you can actually, or you whistle him while he's down there, he'll just try to find you, but he can't get back up there because you're way up there or whatever. So they said, we need a way to get our blob back if we lose him. Now I had just said, game over, you know, hit reset, you know, it's free. <laughs> you know, start over. <laughs> Come on. You're not putting a quarter in or anything. So, um, no, they said we have to have that. So, I had to figure out some way to do that in, I, I, they gave me like 12 hours. They said, we got to have this code back, you know, before the end of the day. I actually had to cancel on a cruise. To a, do it? A, a bay cruise for a friend's birthday that I'd already paid for and, you know. But and, don't tell them what feature you put in. Let them guess. Um, okay. Anybody know what feature he added? Well, there's the hand, which means you already know. The catch of the jelly, jelly, jelly bean. So, again, a pun. Let's the blob catch up. It lets the blob catch up. Um, now, how do you put this thing in there? You know, you know, every time you change a video game code, you potentially introduce new bugs. All right, it's a, it's a risk. And you really, you never do this with released code. You, you know, you, so. So what I ended up doing is there used to be a grape jelly bean that turned the blob into a brick wall. In fact, it looks just like the little brick wall in Pitfall, as it turns out. Because um, the grape wall of China. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this grape jelly bean. And so what I did was I changed the text of grape to ketchup. I added the feature, which wasn't too difficult, that when the, the grape jelly bean, which now the ketchup jelly bean, hits the ground, that point in the code where the jelly bean is turned invisible because it ends, I put a very simple little load store which says move blob, blob position to here. Okay, So very, very minor changes. But then, if you had the blob and you threw the ketchup jelly bean at the blob, he would eat it and turn into a wall. <laughs> So another little patch where I said, don't eat grape, okay? <laughs> and in fact, uh, he had the ability to frown in the animation, so I said, oh, and I'll make him frown if you're trying to feed him a ketchup jelly bean. And so the story became, he hates ketchup, and he won't eat that flavored jelly bean. But it was to make the minimum change to the, to the software to make sure that uh, we didn't introduce new bugs. And about a year later, I was at CES, and I was in a meeting with Nintendo, and I left the meeting, and standing in the hallway was Mr. Miyamoto. And everyone knows who Mr. Miyamoto is, and I had never met him. Uh, so Wana, my contact in Nintendo, introduced me to Mr. Miyamoto. Unfortunately, Dave was not there. And I was very honored to meet him, and he said, I want to let you know that A Boy in a Blob is one of my favorite games. So I was thrilled to hear that, because he does some pretty good games, too. <laughs> So we're running close to time. We yeah, we're running close to time. How about two minutes of um, Q&A, and then you know what we're going to do? They have an open slot, and we're going to reconvene and just continue this at what time? I don't know. Maybe three? It's like three o'clock. Dave is on again later this afternoon. For some reason, they have me and Gary here, and then they have me in a whole hour for to say, tell the same stories? I don't know. Well, and it turns out we covered nothing. We have a million stories we can cover. <laughs> so we'll cover them this afternoon, but if anybody has any quick questions before we wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, they were going to have a, a microphone. Yeah, I got a microphone. Right okay, here. you want to just stand up here and people come up to, or you, yeah. you, can, you can walk to the question. Is this on? Oh, cool. So in the 2600 days, how are you sharing code between California and New Jersey? Or are you just calling up on the phone going, um, increment register X? <laughs> And that probably gets you there. Zero, zero. Oh yeah, we have some attack sequence or <laughs> bullet time code that we use, or is there just five well, versions of bullet time? I mean, time these code. guys had to catch up, so you know they had all of our source files from all of our previous games. So is if this they notebooks sent them? no, these were computer files on the PDP-11, big disks like this. Yeah, the old eight-inch. Uh, That's right. No, yeah. no, the eight-inch. No, hard. Twenty-inch hard, 20 hard platters. Twenty-inch hard platters. Ten-inch yeah. platter disks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, so if they had some question, they might call us and we'd say, well, you know, go look at the way it was done in Fishing Derby. That's going to be really easy. But, you know, most of the work on a 2600 game is the display kernel. It's what we called it. I mean, it's kind of a bastardization of the programming kernel um, terminology, but that's what we called it. And the display, I mean, some of you guys are probably the homebrew guys working on these games. Um, you basically had to count every computer cycle of the program to make sure that it executed within a certain range of time so that it was tracking the TV scan as the scan was going down the screen. And, and that's what you'd spend six weeks on before you had a single thing on the screen. And it was all done on paper. Um, so you would, you would write some code and then you would add up their, the cycles used by that code. Then you would do a branch. Well, now you have two different counts of cycles because you're skipping over some. And then you got three and then four and five. And then you bring this in and bring that in. And they all end up at 192 or whatever at the end of that loop, you know. And it, um, it was extremely detailed work. And so you guys probably looked at a couple of them and said, okay, there's an idea. But you still had to do the work yourself. Oh, sure. We didn't share code very well at all. No, no. It just, it, the it first was, time I remember sharing code is this was at the end of the 2600 era after the crash. We, we had a little time there when we, I think Dave and I and maybe one other guy in our office were the only people on the planet still writing 2600 because there had been a revival in like 86, 87 where Toys R I knew somebody at Toys R Us and they called me and said, you know that 2600 you used to do? I said, we get people coming in all the time asking for games and no one makes them anymore. I said, if you had a 2600 game, we could buy a bunch of them from you. And I said, that sounds like a business opportunity. So I called Dave, and we dusted off some old blue boxes that were in the garbage and did a bunch of second generation 2600 games later. And I remember one of them was Ghostbusters, which we ported at 2600. And I remember, I don't know why, but I remember modeming that code to Dave on an acoustic couple dial-up at like 800 baud. 300. Uh, 300 baud. It took hours, you know, and you could, ee, you could hear in the other room, go, go, you know, and it kept, it die, we had to start over. I, I do remember that. So there were, 2600 did touch it. Yeah, right. What else? Uh, did you guys know that on the Super Nintendo, um, there's a game based on the Casper the Friendly Ghost movie that is actually really, really similar to A Boy in His Blog? Uh, yeah, you should check it out. It's I, they're really copying all the gameplay elements. It's very similar. Casper can change the different type of items. Oh god! And he can do like all the things. He, but he's like shepherding the girl through the world, so it's like kind of reverse roles. But it's actually really cool. They, Is they, that right? It's very similar. You should take a look at it. That's they're pretty funny. Definitely inspired. Yeah, really. Actually, actually that, that game was done first, and we copied yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to tell you that. <laughs> what else? Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, quick question, the game where you wanted a good jingle and you said you could only compose with these certain keys. What game was that? I didn't catch oh, it. Oh, uh, Pressure, Pressure Cooker. Pressure Cooker. I can't sing. So you've both uh, talked quite a bit about the limitations that you faced uh, programming these games. Were those mostly frustrating, or was it cool that you were, you know... Oh, you know, no, it was nothing games? frustrating. Oh, see, it yeah. was fabulous. It, it was ter here? terribly frustrating, but it was so cool we didn't care. No, it was fun. It was like, to me, it was like making a puzzle. Yeah. So, you, so you weren't sitting at your, your terminals just swearing up and down? At the no, no, we, okay. we had times. All right. There was a bug. There was a bug in one game, and I want to think it was a boy in his blob. I'm not sure. It was a, it, I think it was Boy and Blob because we were sitting side by side. And it was late at night, and we were a week away from shipping, and we were screwed. There was some bug. We just spent six, seven hours trying to figure it out. And eventually we gave up, and I said, let's just go eat because it was 11 o'clock at night. We were starving. And we went out, and we went to my favorite pizza place and ordered a giant pizza. And then we had, like, hot fudge sundaes or something. And I said, Dave, I said, if... You know, any other two guys, we would have gotten out and gotten roaring drunk. But that's not us. We're not people who get roaring drunk. So we went out and just ate ourselves to death. But, uh, yeah, that was incredibly frustrating. You got those once in a while. But, no, I mean, it was, the work was just fabulous. Yeah, Steve Cartwright, um, 
had some frustrations because he was working with the four of us, had a lot of experience, and he was trying to learn as he goes, you know. And some of the things he was, he was the guy who was realizing, you have to go through this much just to get that dot on the screen? I mean, you have to do all this. And he once turned to me and he said, there are what, 15 people in the entire world who know how hard it is what we're doing? And he was right. I mean, nobody knew what we were going through. Yeah, no. Nobody had a clue. No. You know, it's a testament to the fact we did it well. You'd had no idea what the limitations were the 2600 when you were playing it, you know? Yeah. But it was a lot of fun. It's like, like Gary said, puzzles. It's like, it's like puzzle solving. solving. You had to enjoy puzzles. Go ahead, over there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, 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 you I can speak. Have you uh, had a chance to take a look at any of the recent homebrews and maybe some of the uh, capabilities that the 2600 is uh, truly capable of with some of the recent releases? Yeah, I mean, you know, I am a hardware engineer and a chip designer as well as a video game programmer. And, um, you know, I made the Pitfall 2, put a special chip in Pitfall 2 to try to expand the capabilities of 2600. So I think that way. And I know that there are a number of those kinds of hardware um, expansions being done for the 2600. And more power to them. I mean, I have a design actually on my computer right now for one that does everything that the, um, the DPC chip did in the Pitfall 2 times 50. And uh, so I always go back sometime and I say, maybe I'll finish this chip and, and make this. Yes, we have talked about doing a homebrew <laughs> yeah. cartridge, the two of us, but we haven't decided to do it yet. Someday we may. Someday we may. Oh, all right. Good. Um, just curious, what are your thoughts on, you know, Activision's a small company, you guys started, you're having fun. What are your thoughts on now it's this big, huge, massive thing and it's not what you started out with, but... It's two completely different companies that happen to share a name. It's really all it is. Um, there was a video game crash in 1984, and uh, Activision survived it, but just barely. And eventually, the venture capitalists who were, had backed Activision, the way, way I think of it is they got tired of trying to explain in cocktail parties why their, their first uh, software investment was now tanking because of this horrible crash in the video game business. And uh, they got tired of trying to explain it, so they fired my president, the president I put in place when we founded it. And they put somebody else in who basically just ran into the ground. And by 1987, I think it was about 87, early 88 maybe, um, the company was bought by Bobby Kotick and moved to LA and they started over. And he had a lot of baggage. There was a lot of debt that was hidden. There were a lot of things that the other, the management group, that I had no, no idea what they were doing. They had run into the ground. So I don't think of it as the same company. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, Bobby did a fabulous job turning it into the biggest company in the world. And in doing that, he's generated a lot of hate. <laughs> OK. Uh, I don't uh, comment on that. You know, some pe people have strong opinions of him one way or the other. But it's just, uh, it's just a different company that happens to share a name. When Bobby bought that company, the name Activision was independently valued at $50 million, the name. In other words, what you would have to do to get the marketing recognition that the name Activision had because of all the great games that came in the 80s, you'd have to pay $50 million. And he bought the company for $600,000. And he assumed the biggest, the, 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 the thing that really put the nail in the coffin was Activision lost a lawsuit to Magnavox on the Ralph Baer patents. The Ralph Baer patents terrorized the game industry for 17 years. Magnavox never made any money off the Odyssey, but they made about $100 million off patents. And they w systematically sued everybody in the game industry. And when they got to Activision, Activision lost $6 million judgment, didn't have $6 million, and basically all but went bankrupt over that judgment until Bobby came in and said, I'll buy the company for $600,000, I'll take care of Magnavox, and he gave them a bunch of stock in the new organization. So it really is a different company. It is. Totally different. Yeah. Good. So anybody who's interested in continuing this, we're going to be back on in a couple hours.